Um, okay, I guess um, a little cut off on time here, so I will try to go quick. Um, thank you for sticking around for this. I know this is a late talk here. But um, so we're going to talk about the lessons that we've learned from analyzing 1 billion downloads um, on our platform at Scarf. Um, just to very quickly introduce myself, uh, I'm the found my name is Avi Press. I'm the founder and CEO of Scarf. Um, I'm an open source maintainer myself. Uh, I'm very into functional programming. If you're you're into that kind of thing, um, Scarf is a four year old company. Um, what we do is we provide open source usage analytics to projects that want to know more about how their software is being used. Um, we work with both. Uh, we work with both non-commercial open source as well as uh, commercial open source businesses, and that want to know more about how their projects are being used. Um, and we try to promote promote open source sustainability by helping you know businesses understand you know response in a responsible way um, you know where their opportunities might sit. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the data um, is, how we collected it. We'll talk about the trends that were there and what we can learn and why you should care. Um, so we, this analysis here is scoped to about 2,500 packages um, that are distributed on Scarf. This is largely Docker containers, Helm charts, um, binaries, tarballs, um, language level packages. We looked at JavaScript and Python, and then also some Terraform modules as well that were being distributed. Um, yeah, again, so both commercial, non-commercial open source, um, single vendor, multi-vendor, um, and a lot of um, foundation held open source. So stuff that's in the Linux Foundation, uh, the Apache Software Foundation, CNCF, and a whole bunch more. Um, it's actually a little more data than the title implies. We're looking at about 2.7 billion downloads total that have happened on the platform. Um, and it's about 19 million-ish users. Um, and the IP address metadata comes from uh, multiple data sources that we work with. It's things like Whois Records, but also vendors like IP Registry, Clearbit, Sixth Sense, et cetera. Um, and so how we collect this data is largely um, via uh, registry gateways, uh, so, so a service that's sitting in front of, say, Docker Hub or GitHub uh, container registry, these kinds of things, proxying or redirecting data to the registry, um, and you know, with that you can uh, get a little bit of information about the request and the download that happened. Um, this also takes place with things like post-install telemetry, so we have like a JavaScript library that will do this. Um, once we have this, these downloads, we'll process the metadata asynchronously, um, look up data about the IP address, and then we anonymize it. So we discard the IP. We are no, not holding on to any sensitive data by doing this. Um, yeah, so just in terms of kind of the, the volume of data that we are looking at, like these are basically kind of the, the numbers from Scarf. And so in Q1, we're looking at um, about 650 million downloads that are on the platform. This has been steadily, um, you know, growing quarter over quarter. Um, but the, you know, the trends that we're seeing in this have kind of are, are, are very clearly falling out of that data. And so one thing that's really interesting about this is, you know, we're talking about anonymous software downloads. So like when we say it happened from this many users, what do we even mean? Um, and so in Scarf, the way that we address this is we talk about kind of two different notions of uniqueness. We, we refer to an endpoint ID, which is essentially just a hash of an IP address. So, you know, multiple people from one location are still going to be one endpoint ID. We also have origin IDs, um, and that's where we hash things like the IP address, but also the user agent and any other identifiers that we can find. Um, endpoint IDs will undercount by some amount. Origin IDs will sometimes overcount if there's, say, like you know, a Python client and also a browser. Like those are two different origin IDs, and so. You know, this is kind of a tough problem to get at, like, a user. It, like, what does that mean? And this is how we, we track both of these kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, we're acting largely as a registry in a lot of these cases. We're not hosting the software, but we sit in front of the registry. And so what kinds of things can the registry see, the kinds of things that we can analyze here? You know, what, it's, it's, you know, what artifact was being downloaded, uh, when it was downloaded, the time series of those downloads, the user agent, HP headers, and an IP address. It's not that much data, but you can actually get quite a bit out of it. Um, and you know, one thing that we've learned from this, uh, I mean, not that this is news to everyone, but you know, open source is being used like really, really everywhere. Um, there's a couple, there, there's like you know, t uh, two countries we have not, uh, have not seen any open source downloads from, but otherwise um, the whole globe is covered um, pretty comprehensively. 
um, you know, like in, in some really, really remote areas as well. So like, you know, deep in, deep in Antarctica, like really, really uh, far, far up in, um, you know, in Canada, Greenland, and just was kind of uh, interesting uh, fun facts about the data of kind of pretty extreme environments where people are downloading open source packages. What's also been kind of surprising to us is that we see governments around the world use open source. Um, there are some places where we have not seen um, government traffic, but kind of the idea is that um, with any IP address, um, there is a connection type associated with that that most data providers will provide, and government is, is one of those. And so, you know, we will see the public sector organizations that are using open source, and um, I think this is one of those things that people are often very surprised by to see, like, oh, the Department of Homeland Security is using my software. That's very weird. Um, I wonder what they're doing. But this kind of thing happens a lot. Um, and so we actually see quite a bit of activity um, from the United States, quite a bit of activity from Brazil, all over Europe, um, it, which I think was uh, a surprise to us and definitely a surprise to a lot of our users. So like I said, the connection type is one of the things that we're seeing a piece of metadata on any of these IP addresses. Um, a lot of the volume is coming from just kind of ISPs broadly. Um, we do see a good amount that comes to so, so the green being hosting providers, so you know your, your EC2 instances, GCP instances, et cetera. Um, a big slice being uh, businesses, and that's you know what things like our customers care a lot about. That's where a lot of opportunity lives, and that's where some really valuable data uh, lies as well. Um, you can see like yeah, like the government stuff is a really really small slice, but uh, it is there. We've seen 1.2 million corporate uh, corporate connections. Um, so this is 1.2 million businesses that have downloaded a piece of open source that Scarf was sitting in front of. Um, this is really valuable stuff to the businesses that commercialize open source. And if we want to see a more sustainable open source ecosystem, we have to pay a lot of attention to this because there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and the more that we can help connect the maintainers to these, these kinds of businesses, um, the, the more we can support the open source ecosystem. So, you know, like we were just talking about funding in terms of like donations and these kinds of things. This is where like there's real custom, potential customers in there for the businesses that commercialize open source. 95% of the Fortune 500 has downloaded software through Scarf um, in the time that we have been around. And so, um, you know, they're, they're like the, the Linux Foundation put out surveys about like, you know, what percent of, you know, the big companies are using open source. And this has given us kind of an empirical way to, to demonstrate that uh, without asking people, but just tracking it. Um, and so uh, I think this has also been uh, quite, quite an interesting figure. Um, in terms of public clouds, it, we're an American company, so I think it's kind of skewed in, in, in some way as a result of that, but a lot of the traffic has come from Amazon, um, Google being next, and then Hetzner, um, a European uh, provider, uh, coming after that. So if you are an open source maintainer and you're wondering, uh, you know, which clouds do I need to care about the most when it comes to whatever kind of support that you are going to do, I would say you should put most of your effort into AWS. It's probably not a surprise, but the data does show it. Um, if you are, um, if you're wondering about container registries, we do a lot of um, proxying to the to the um, container registries. Um, Docker Hub is the most popular, which I don't think is a surprise, but what people may be surprised is that GHCR is actually quite popular. Um, what I did not get time to put into this um, doc is that Docker Hub's market share quarter over quarter is actually increasing, though, uh, at, at quite a rate. And so um, in terms of the total volume of downloads we are seeing, a bigger portion of those are moving to Docker Hub over time. Um, and Docker Hub is kind of the, the, the dominant one in general. Um, other than those two, and then Quay, which is Red Hat's, um, pretty much all other container registries are pretty negligible. 2.2% of the downloads that we saw were on a VPN. Um, we are able to detect, or, you know, I, Take this with a slight grain of salt, too, because it's not like we can necessarily know every single VPN provider out there, but the ones that like the metadata providers have, you have about 2.2%. Um, so for folks that are kind of like worried about that kind of thing and how it can affect these kinds of measurements, the answer is like somewhat, but not really a whole lot. Uh, sorry, just checking on time here. One thing that I think can't, comes as a surprise to a lot of our users is that your total downloads versus your unique downloads are very, very different. Um, on the left-hand side, we have kind of the millions in downloads, and on the right is the millions in uniques. 
what we see empirically is that if you have a thousand downloads and you're trying to answer the question of how many people was that, um, probably about two orders of magnitude off, which is kind of crazy. But the reason that that is the case is that things like CI, you know, CI pipelines, bots, mirrors, it makes up a lot of the traffic. We would sometimes like to look at our download counts and be like, wow, I did such, this is so awesome. And then you see how many sources of, of um, you know, connections that actually came from, um, and it is quite a sobering thing to look at. Um, the reality is people raise millions and millions of dollars on spikes and download counts, and it's all fake. Uh, or not fake, but it, it's, it's meaningless. It's not useful. Um, and this is, this, is, this is the reality of the situation. Um, yeah, so like I said, you know, average ratio, about 100 to 1 in terms of um, total downloads to unique users behind that. Um, however, we do, when we do the analysis on like what do better packages look like, we see something closer to 15 to 1. So you know, it's not the same for all different types of artifacts, um, different programming language, et cetera, but this is kind of how it nets out on average across our platform. Um, and you know, so like I said, um, th this this graph shows. So we work with this organization called Linux Server. They containerize random things out there and put them out there so people can use them with Docker. And they found a really interesting interesting thing where they had multiple spikes and downloads from one of their things, WireGuard, that they have uh, repackaged and redistributed. And the spikes that they saw were just totally like it was nothing. Um, with this uh, with this container, WireGuard. Um, they had billions of downloads on this thing, and there were 20 IPs that made up like almost all of the traffic. And so, um, this kind of thing happens. Um, it, it, it does. It's uh, like you know, sometimes it's just like a misconfigured system that's just pulling all the time, and this kind of thing happens a lot more than we'd like to think. Yeah, and so like, this is why this matters. Is like, there's so much time and resources that are wasted because we are being misled by these kinds of numbers. And um, you know, I think the more that we start to track this stuff, I think the more um, we're helping people kind of face the realities of the data. Um, yeah, and so you know, the user agents also help us a lot in this uh, vein. You know, when we look at the kinds of user agents that we see, um, you know, we see a lot of like OHTP client and Docker, but you know, we also see these things in red, like the Renovate bots, the Scopios, the uptime robots, these kinds of things that are just pulling and pulling and pulling, um, and they blow up a lot of the stats. Um, one thing which is um, you know really cool that we see is that some some um, clients will give a lot of rich information in their user agents and so you know um, when we look at like what pip does where they even send a CI flag so you know if it's in CI which is really really cool um, you know the, we also see things like system information you know build information all these kinds of things and one like ask that I have to the open source community broadly is do more things like like this, it helps a lot of people out to understand how their systems are used. Please be more like PIP, it's awesome. Um, you know, and, and well, sometimes we see Go HTTP client, we're just like, okay, I, it's really hard to know what that is. Um, it's often, um, it's often things like, you know, even, even various container clients will just send Go HTTP client, which is really unfortunate. Um, one surprise here um, is that we like to think that people will upgrade when we cut new releases, and the reality is they don't. Um, not super surprising to some, maybe, but, um, but the, the converse of this is that if you distribute a container and you tag a latest, that is what most people are going to download. Um, and so the, the defaults matter a lot in terms of like what your, you know, if you have a runtime, a package manager, et cetera, the defaults are very, very important. However, um, most people are not going to download your artifact twice. Just the reality. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm yeah, kind of wrapping up, trying to get get, get through this on time here. Um, why does this matter? Um, you know, we're talking about open source sustainability. We're talking about you know how do we support the open source ecosystem? We can work a lot more effectively if we are not making guesses about what is going on. Um, 
And also, I think there's there's uh, a thing here about trying to change people's attitudes about collecting um, usage metrics in the open source world. Um, the work that we're doing at Scarf shows that this can be done responsibly. Um, you know, we do this in a GDPR compliant way, CCPA compliant, etc. This stuff can be done um, in a way that is you know safe and compliant um, and preserves uh, and respects end user privacy. And so, our current status quo for how we treat metrics is. Um, I would say generally um, doing the open source community disservice. And more importantly, the registries already have this data. Like nothing that SCARF is collecting is new information. The registries have always had it. They just don't share it. And that's uh, that in a lot of ways I think is quite tragic. Um, You've probably heard a lot of people talk about Redis this week and HashiCorp this week. And if we want to see less people changing their licenses and moving away from open source, we have to make open source more you know, amenable to these kinds of things that will help us do our jobs more effectively. Um, and so I think you know, when, we, when we talk about this conversation, um, instead of just us saying like, ah, how could they do this? They should have just been a better business or they should have just understood the dynamics that they were in. Uh, I say no to that. We need to support open source businesses more systemically and you know, the, the registry is kind of playing ball a little bit more and helping maintainers get this data more natively, I think will go a very long way in a concrete way. It's a concrete thing that we can do that will actually make a, a real difference. Um, yeah, and I, I think you know, if you're a maintainer, please put more you know readable um, you know readable information into your user agents. Um, you know, keep in mind the dynamics of total downloads to unique downloads. Um, you know, keep in mind that there's huge outliers in in this kind of data. Um, and you know, I think in, in general, you know, if you are maintaining an open source project, um, I'd encourage you to be more curious about the metrics um, about how it is used. Cool. Um, thank you very much. If you want to learn more about SCARF or connect with me, QR code's there, but I um, appreciate it. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one. No, uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely take any other questions, but I appreciate that everyone was here at the very, very end of the day. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, we didn't do that kind of cutting up in the analysis. Um, it's definitely something that we could publish after the fact. I mean, the thing with you know the Python world is that um, there's a very broad system of mirror, packaging mirrors. So if you check PyPI stats, they even break out your downloads by which ones came from mirrors. And if you look at the amounts, it's like pretty significant how much mirrors are like just keeping themselves up to date um, with PyPI. Um, this is one of those things too, where like, yeah, the more immutability you can provide at the registry level, the less uh, other agents have to check if they're up to date. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's one of those things also where our JavaScript tools, which are built more on post-installation hooks, are uh, it happens a little bit less often. It's kind of a best effort thing, whereas if you're sitting at the registry, you collect all the noise, um, and so um, it's just it, it's it's also kind of a matter of like. Yeah, how much you know duplication and noise is in the data as well. So, sorry, it's kind of a non-answer to that, but I think um, we we should follow up on this and republish with this exact kind of breakdown. I think would be very useful. Yeah, cool. Uh, sure, you can go first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, the actual last one. Yeah. Sure. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so um, we get the data a few different ways. So the main way with these like registry gateways, it, the idea is that you know you you might like CNAME a domain to us, and you say, hey, instead of doing a Docker pull from Docker Hub, do a Docker pull from like my endpoint, and that's basically going to us, and we redirect the traffic to the registry. Um, so it's kind of like a link shortener. So like people will, like drop the links to their artifacts and like release notes and these kinds of things, and that's us. So we're basically like we are the first hop in that in that network chain, essentially. 
We also will track, you know, the like post installation. So like our JavaScript library um, just has a post install hook. So on npm install, package is installed, scarf is installed, scarf sends off a, a, a one call to us. Um, so typically this is kind of this is at download time, at build time, or in the container world, even at container invocation time. Um, even when you start a Docker container, it will check with the registry if it is up to date with the latest contents for the given tag. And so we do see invocations of containers as well. Um, and then, of course, if people like instrument their code with the telemetry, we will see all that stuff too. Does that address that fully, or I don't know if there's any other? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. So typically, so yeah, we will be working with like the project maintainers that make this kind of change. So they are the ones coming to us. Um, yeah. So like, I mean, we definitely have a slant towards commercial open source for sure. That's like the ones who are most incentivized to do this kind of thing very directly. Um, but so Scarf is partnered with the Linux Foundation, and so like a lot of the you know we have a lot of projects using us with the LF and the CNCF and um, LFAI. Same with like the Apache Software Foundation as well. And so like I think. We're in projects that are large enough and kind of there's enough of them that I think some of the, a good amount of this bias has probably been smoothed out, but some of it surely still remains. We're also an American company and things come with that too. Um, so yeah, it's like kind of hard to give like a really good concrete answer to like how skewed is this data of like everything, everything that happens. But um, you know, this is 2.7 billion software downloads over the course of like a year and a half. So that's um, um, it's something. I think we're probably we're probably approaching single digits of like what is happening more broadly, at least with some of the bigger kind of big registries that we talk to. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you.